With Chapter 12, we move to investing in stocks. Our learning objectives pretty much mirror those on bonds. Identify the most important features of common and preferred stock. Explain how you can evaluate stock investments. Analyze the numerical measures that cause a stock to increase or decrease in value. Describe how stocks are bought and sold. And explain the trading techniques used by long-term investors and short-term speculators. While we probably all know where to see the latest data on the Dow or the S&P 500, where do we get information on common stocks? And what does it mean when we get it? First, let's review of exactly what common stock is. It's called equity because as an owner of a share of common stock, you are an owner of the company. You share in its profits. Firms issue common stock to raise the funds to start a new business or to expand. The pluses to common stock are that the funds have no maturity. They don't have to be repaid by the company ever. Dividends are not an obligation of the firm. A firm's board of directors votes each quarter on if a dividend will be paid and how much. The downside for the firm is that stockholders vote. They're the owners and they can affect the direction of the firm. This can be tough for entrepreneurs to no longer have total control of their company. Three major points to keep in mind when considering an investment in common stock. Overall, stocks tend to average 10% annual returns, but many stocks lose a lot. Stocks are riskier than bonds. The time value of money plays a role here. The key is to let your money work over a long period of time. Trying to trade in and out of the market, so-called market timing, is not usually a winning strategy. This slide basically recaps the features of common stock we went over briefly a few slides back. We, as investors, view stock as an investment on which we expect to make money. The companies issuing stock are doing it to finance the operations of the firm. They're selling a share in the business in return for voting rights and potentially dividends, which are a share of the company's profits. Think back to accounting and the link between the income statement and the balance sheet. The bottom line on the income statement is net income. Net income can only be used in two ways, paid out as dividends or added to retained earnings on the balance sheet, which means retained earnings are funds which belong to the shareholders but haven't been paid yet. As a shareholder, you don't have to attend the firm's annual meeting to vote your shares. Nowadays, it's done online via proxyvote.com. As an investor in common stock, we can expect to make money in two ways, cash and capital gains. The cash can come in the form of cash or stock dividends. Capital gains is the increase in the stock price, which is what we want to see happen. A firm does not have to pay dividends, and young firms rarely do, as they are reinvesting everything in growing the business. Once a firm begins to pay dividends, they tend to continue, as investors expect them, and they expect them to grow. Once a firm decides to pay dividends, they're typically paid quarterly, and the board of directors votes each quarter on the amount. Four dates of importance. The declaration date, the date the board votes for the dividend. The record date, the date the stock's record books close, so you have to be the owner of record on this date to receive the dividend. The ex-dividend date, it's the second business day before the record date. On this date, the stock starts trading without the dividend. And the payment date, of course, is the day the payment is actually made. There is common thinking that the optimal stock price is between $20 and $80 a share. The thinking being that in that range, the average investor can afford to buy a round lot of 100 shares. Firms may split to get their share price back inside this range. Clearly, some firms like Apple trading the day I was writing this at $209.18 a share, Google trading at $1,224, and Berkshire Hathaway A trading for a whopping $312,000 per share, they're not concerned. Stock splits are viewed as positive news and frequently result in the stock price increasing after the split. Typical splits are two for one or three for one, simply meaning if you own 100 shares currently trading at $50 a share, after a two-for-one split, you own 200 shares, trading initially at $25 a share. Preferred stock is a hybrid. It's sort of like common stock in that it pays a dividend, but it's really more like a bond in that the dividend is typically fixed. Preferred stock has no maturity date and no voting rights. Preferred stock dividends are paid before common stock dividends, but they may be skipped. 
Most preferred stock today is cumulative, meaning any skipped dividends must be caught up before any dividends can be paid to common shareholders. Now that we understand exactly what common stock is, how do we choose which ones to invest in? Before you choose a stock, you definitely need to do some research. The good news is, with today's technology, this is easier than ever. Keep in mind, not only do you need to consider the issuing company, but also the state of the domestic and global economy. A huge factor is how much risk you're personally willing to take. This is Exhibit 1-3 on page 391 in your text. It recaps the major categories of stocks and the terms typically used to refer to them. Blue chips are those large, well-known firms with a long history of strong financial performance. Cyclical stocks are those that rise and fall with the economy. Defensive stocks are those that are basically immune to swings in the economy. Walmart is considered a defensive stock. Growth stocks are those obviously expected to grow in the future. Income stocks are those expected to pay high dividends. The final five categories relate to firm size in terms of market capitalization, meaning share price times the number of shares outstanding. Large cap, over 10 billion. Micro cap, 50 million to 300 million. Mid cap, 2 billion to 10 billion. Penny, stock selling for less than $5 a share. And small cap, with a market cap between 300 million and 2 billion. Internet sources are an excellent source of investing information tending to be more up-to-date than printed material. Firms post financial and forecast information on their websites. My personal favorite source is Yahoo Finance, where you can find everything. This is from Yahoo Finance, Exhibit 12-4 on page 392. Here you can see a full picture of the data available for a firm, in this case, Facebook. The current share price and the open bid and ask prices and quantities. The price range for the day and the 52-week range. The volume traded the market cap in billions, the firm's beta, P.E. ratio, and earnings per share, the latter labeled TTM, trailing 12 months. Dividend data is also shown. Look at the menu line just below the stock price. You can choose to see statistics, financials, as well as analyst forecast. A host of data that it used to take a lot of time to collect. There are also professional advisory services available for a fee. The most well-known are Value Line, Standard & Poor's, and Merchant. Print coverage on the markets is not as widespread as it once was. Full coverage is always available in the Wall Street Journal. A firm's website will typically provide a link to its annual report, which all publicly traded firms must publish. These are also available online from the SEC. Before investing, you should obtain and read the firm's prospectus, telling you all about the stock issue. Business periodicals offer another resource, so you might check some of those listed on the slide. Exhibit 12.5 on page 394 shows a full value line report for Disney. Current price, P.E. and dividend yield, as well as data going back to 2000 for revenue, cash flow, earnings, and a list of other metrics. Value line may be available in your local or school library. Additionally, the value line report for each of the Dow 30 is online and available for free. This slide demonstrates how some of the numbers fit together for the Boeing company. Given data, stock price $75.43, annual dividend $1.76, P.E. ratio 14.13, earnings per share $5.34. So the P.E. ratio is equal to the price per share divided by the earnings per share. $75.43 divided by $5.34 is the $14.13. Why the focus on price to earnings and earnings per share? because earnings is the most important number that influences the value of a firm's stock. As the slide states, it reflects the financial health of the firm. Earnings per share is often the number that analysts watch and forecast as an increase is a positive signal. So let's take a closer look at the earnings metrics. Price earnings ratio, as we've seen, is just the stock price divided by earnings per share. How much an investor is willing to pay for $1 of earnings? High P.E. ratios indicate investors expect strong growth from a firm, even though earnings may now be low. Low P.E. ratios imply the opposite, and many old-line firms with limited future growth would fall in this category. P.E.s of a single firm should be compared to others in the same industry and the industry average overall. Analysts typically try to forecast earnings using historical data and future prospects. 
Dividend yield is of interest to those wanting more income from a stock. Then how much a firm is paying and its historical growth is critical. As with earnings, a growing dividend is a healthy sign of financial strength for a firm. They would not raise the dividend payout unless they felt confident they could maintain it. Other factors that influence a stock's price include the firm's beta and book value per share. Beta reflects how volatile a firm's stock price is versus the market overall. A beta greater than one means historically this stock's price moves more than the markets, up or down. A beta less than one means the opposite, a stock whose price is more stable than the market. Book value per share is simply the firm's total equity divided by the number of shares outstanding. A firm's stock should be trading above the book value per share. A stock price less than the book value indicates that investors do not believe the firm's management is doing a good job. The market price you're willing to pay uses time value of money principles to discount expected future dividends and future selling price back to today, a bit beyond what we're going to cover in this class. Finally, be careful of market bubbles. Investors become overly optimistic and drive prices above reasonable levels. Bubbles burst. Common stock trades in two basic types of markets, primary and secondary. The primary market is when a firm sells stock directly to an investor, usually via an investment banking firm. The key point is that the money from the sale goes to the issuing firm. When a firm goes public for the first time via an IPO, it's done in the primary market. In the secondary markets, stock trades are between two investors. No funds go to the issuer. A securities exchange is simply a marketplace where buyers and sellers come together to trade. In this case, they trade stock. Securities sold on a traditional exchange must be listed. When the news media refers to the listed market, they mean the New York Stock Exchange. On the New York Stock Exchange, designated market makers are charged with maintaining a fair and orderly market and oversee the buying and selling of a specific set of stocks. Designated market makers are primarily brokers. They bring buyers and sellers together. Think real estate broker. Stocks not formally listed trade over the counter. The major over the counter market in the United States is NASDAQ. NASDAQ is not a physical marketplace, but rather a network of dealers connected electronically. Where on the New York Stock Exchange, each designated market maker handles a specific set of stocks, in a dealer market like NASDAQ, there can be multiple dealers making a market in a stock, meaning they stand ready to buy or sell at any time. In a dealer market, the dealer is the middleman in all trades, profiting from the difference between the price he buys a share for and what he sells it for. Think used car dealer. Though you can trade online yourself, many of us choose to trade through a stockbroker or account executive who's licensed to trade for clients. Working with a broker, you should watch for any activity in your account you consider questionable. Since your broker earns a commission on every trade he makes for you, watch especially for churning, excessive buying and selling strictly to generate fees. You have the option to trade via a full-service brokerage firm or a discount firm. As you might expect, full service means you get a lot of service and you pay for it. Discount means you pay less but get fewer services and you may need to be comfortable trading online. You might want to start out with full service and move down as you become more comfortable trading on your own. When deciding between full service and discount brokerages, consider, can you trade by phone or over the internet? What's the typical commission? Is there a toll-free number for service? How much research and assistance do you get and what are the charges? What other fees are you going to be charged? There are hundreds of different types of trade orders, but we'll only look at the three most common. A market order is basically buy it now or sell it now at the current price. A limit order is considered a priced order, since it specifies that a trade should not take place unless the price reaches a certain level and a trade can be made at that level or better. A stop-loss order is also a priced order, but slightly different. It specifies that a trade should be made when the price reaches a certain level. When the stop price is hit, the order becomes a market order and it's executed. Brokers charge commissions to make trades for you. And as we've already noted, full-service firms charge more than discount firms, and they charge more than you trading for yourself online. Finally, let's look at some trading strategies. Long-term strategy should be what you are considering when investing in stock. Buy and hold is the most basic strategy. Buy a strong stock with good future prospects and hold it for the long term. 
Dollar cost averaging involves making repetitive purchases of the same stock over time. DRIPS are automatic dividend reinvestment plans, and we'll look at each of these on the following slides. Buy and hold is the most basic investment strategy. Choose strong stocks and leave them to grow in price while you reap the dividends. Dollar cost averaging is a long-term technique used to invest in the same stock over a number of years. In the example on the slide, the investor makes a $2,000 investment each year at whatever the market price is. Over time, the normal market moves. This minimizes your cost per share. Some firms allow direct investment, buying stock directly from the firm without a broker. Dividend reinvestment plans are offered by most major companies. You can elect to reinvest your dividends in more stock of the firm. The advantages are that fees are typically lower and stock is frequently offered at a better than market price. Short-term investment strategies are for the more adventurous. Buying on margin involves borrowing money from your broker to finance part of your purchase. Minimum margin levels are set by the Fed, but your broker can require a higher percentage. This is a leveraging technique. Selling short involves selling stock you don't own. You think the price is going to go down, so basically you sell high, buy low. Your broker borrows the stock and sells it for you with the anticipation that you will buy it back when the price drops to replace the borrowed shares. Very risky. If the price goes up instead of down, you'll have to buy the shares that are higher priced to replace them. Trading in options is, as the slide states, not for beginners. It involves buying the right to buy or sell shares of a stock at a specified price over a short time frame, usually three to six months. This is also a leveraging technique, allowing you to basically control a number of shares for a period of time for a fraction of the cost of the shares themselves. If this sounds interesting to you, take the time to learn more about options and option trading before you jump in. This ends Chapter 12, and as always, we'll review the learning objectives. We started learning the most important features of common and preferred stock. How to evaluate stock. Numerical measures that drive stock price changes. Continuation on numerical measures. How stocks are bought and sold. And continued. Trading techniques of short-term and long-term investors. Exhibit 12.4 for auto readers.